G'day everyone and whoa, what was that? Oh. Oh. <gasps> get down, get down. Oh my god. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that was, that was, I suppose that was possible. Yep. Oh, oh. What? What? Oh, no, hold on. Maybe just, maybe just wait for the... Yeah, that's, that's, that's not what you want. Yeah, 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 okay. All right, it's time to talk about fuel control and ventilation control, which is one of the most important concepts that you can understand as a structural firefighter. Now, I've tried to make this video a few times already, and each time it's ended up way too long and way too technical. And so instead of making a long and technical video that I don't think any of you are gonna to get to the end of, this is just a introduction to fuel control and ventilation control with a little bit of technical stuff sprinkled in. Now, I should also say that there's some pretty cool footage at the end of this video of fires moving from fuel control into ventilation control. And so if you stick around that long, that's gonna be pretty cool to watch. All right, so I guess we should jump into it. And so what exactly is fuel control and ventilation control? So to answer that, we're gonna start by having a look at fuel control. And a good example of a fuel controlled fire is a campfire burning outside. Because as it is burning, it has access to all the air that it could ever need. And the heat comes from the fire's self-sustaining chemical reaction. And so it is the available fuel that is the determining factor how large or small the fire becomes. Because if we throw more logs on the fire, the fire will grow larger. And if we don't put any additional fuel on at all, then the fire will eventually burn down and grow smaller. And so because of this, we can think of this fire as a fuel controlled fire, where it is the fuel that is the determining factor that dictates just how large or small the fire is going to be. Now the question is, is can we apply this to a structure fire? And the answer is yes, because as a fire is in its developing stages, the smoke layer will be very high and the fire itself will only be affecting fuel immediately around it that are being exposed to the fire's radiation. And so when a fire is burning in this stage, it can be thought of as a fuel controlled fire because it has access to all of the oxygen that it needs the heat is still coming from the fire's chemical reaction and it is only the available fuel that is affecting how large the fire is at that given point in time. Now this just shows us that fires in their developing stage can be thought of as fuel controlled fires. But as we know, fires don't stay in their developing stage forever because at some point the fire will progress towards flashover. And as this happens, the conditions inside the room will significantly change and affect just how that fire is going to burn. Because as a fire progresses towards flashover, one way that this occurs is that the smoke layer will begin to descend from the ceiling. And as that smoke layer descends from the ceiling, it will begin to block the available oxygen entering that room. Now this is happening while the fire is beginning to affect more and more fuels. And therefore, right as the time as the fire's oxygen supply is becoming restricted, the fire itself actually wants more and more air. And so while the available oxygen supply is going down, the fire's air needs are going up. And this takes us towards a ventilation controlled state where it is no longer the fuel that controls the size of the fire, but it is the available oxygen. Now, one of the main contributing factors to why this occurs is the large amounts of modern synthetic materials that we find inside buildings today. Because pound for pound, these materials have a higher heat of combustion, lower thermal inertia, and a much higher mass loss rate than more natural materials like timber. Now this means that these fuels can pyrolyze and break down faster. And when they do, they release much greater amounts of fuel 
and release more energy as they are being burnt. But to be able to do this, these fuels need access to lots of oxygen, which means that as these fuels are breaking down and releasing large amounts of flammable smoke, they also need a steady supply of oxygen so that those fuels can be oxidised. And if there isn't a steady supply of oxygen, then we start to see more fuel being released than there is oxygen to oxidise those fuels. And so we end up in a very fuel-rich state. And so if we have a look at how this is actually happening, if a fire is burning natural materials like wood, and it has a sufficient ongoing air supply, then a lot of the products coming off that fire will be products of complete combustion, like carbon dioxide. Whereas, if we begin to reduce the oxygen supply, or if we are burning a modern synthetic material which has a much higher mass loss rate, then we should expect to see an abundance of fuel being released without necessarily having enough oxygen to fully oxidise those fuels. Now, the result of this is as the fire is burning, there will be more and more fuels going unoxidised, which means that we will begin to see less of the products of complete combustion like carbon dioxide, and we will begin to see more products of incomplete combustion in their place, like carbon monoxide and carbon. Now this just goes to show that as a fire starts to become underventilated, we will see a dramatic rise in the products of incomplete combustion. And this just goes to explain why it is that if we are burning modern synthetic materials, they are more likely to create large black plumes than products burning in more natural materials like wood. Now, we do know that natural materials can create large black plumes, and we quite often see it in bushfires, where the sheer heat release rate of the fire is able to produce so many products of pyrolysis then there is simply too much fuel for the available oxygen to successfully oxidise those fuels. But in terms of a structure fire, we see this at almost every fire, because modern structure fires have access to large amounts of modern synthetic materials, and because of the buildings that are built over these fires, we are also greatly restricting the oxygen that is available to these fires, meaning that we have an abundance of fuel and a very limited air supply. And so this just forces the fire to burn inefficiently. And as a result, these fires will begin to produce more and more products of incomplete combustion, like carbon monoxide, hydrogen cyanide, carbon, formaldehyde, benzene, and particulate matter. And so this just goes to show that while well-ventilated fires can still create a large amount of very dangerous products. By comparison, underventilated fires will generally create exponentially more of these products due to the nature of the modern synthetic materials and their ventilation limited state. Now I should also point out that while this animation is useful in illustrating my point, it is also a major oversimplification of the complexity that is involved when a fire is burning. But it is a useful tool to demonstrate the concept of what is happening in a fire when it becomes ventilation controlled. So now that we've seen the theory behind ventilation control, we're going to have a look at two different fires moving from a fuel controlled state through to ventilation control. And we're going to start with a fire that is burning with very limited oxygen supply. Because if you have a look at this room here, the windows are closed and the door is only very slightly cracked open. Now this means that the smoke layer will quickly descend from the ceiling and begin to further block the available oxygen from entering the room. And therefore we can see that this fire very quickly moves into a ventilation controlled state where there is only a small amount of oxygen that can still be drawn in towards the fire through the slightly open door. Now, this means that this fire's growth has been greatly inhibited by the lack of oxygen, because as it is burning, the compartment boundaries of the room and the smoke layer are both acting to block any additional oxygen from accessing the fire. And so we can clearly see that this fire's growth has been slowed by a lack of oxygen. And we can very clearly see that this fire is mainly burning within the smoke layer meaning that the combustion that is taking place is very inefficient, which leads to the creation of more smoke 
and therefore even less oxygen is going to be able to enter into the room. Now, if we were to give this fire air by the way of opening a door, we would then expect to see the fire's heat release rate increase as the air accesses the fire and allows it to burn more efficiently. And that's actually what we do here because we open the door to the room, which allows some of the smoke to leave and some additional oxygen to be drawn in towards the fire. And as this happens, more of the products of pyrolysis are able to be oxidized by the fire, which allows the fire to generate more heat, and therefore that heat is able to access more fuels. Now this leads to more fuels catching on fire, therefore the overall requirement for air in the room goes up, meaning that more air now needs to be drawn into the room to allow the fire to burn the additional fuels that it is now pyrolyzing. And so, because of this, we can see that by adding additional air to the fire, we will not only allow that fire's heat release rate to increase and the fire to be able to spread, but it is very likely that that fire will remain within a ventilation controlled state, even though we've allowed more oxygen to the fire. Because now, what we have is a larger fire that is pyrolyzing more fuel than it was before. But now it has a much higher heat release rate, meaning the fire will now spread faster than it was before. And this is a very important concept behind ventilation controlled fires, because as we give these fires air, we should expect that the heat release rate to increase, and it is quite likely that the fire will go through a ventilation induced flashover, meaning because it is a ventilation controlled fire, and we have given it air, we have now given it the very thing that the fire needed to be able to rapidly increase in size. And so this just clearly demonstrates that whether it be due to firefighters gaining entry to the building or ventilation through another tactic, any ventilation needs to be planned, systematic and coordinated with the effective application of water because in the absence of effective water application on the fire, air increases the heat release rate and potential for rapid fire development. Now, in our first example, we were looking at a fire that was burning with a very limited air supply. And so its growth rate looked quite similar to this graph here. Whereas in our second example, we're going to look at a fire that has access to a lot more air via an open door. And therefore, we'll be seeing a growth rate that is very different. And so in this example, we should expect to see a growth rate that looks a little bit more like this, where the fire is able to rapidly develop until it uses up all of the oxygen in the room, where it will then enter into a ventilation controlled state. So as you can see with this fire, it is burning with a very good ongoing air supply with a door that is left fully open to the room. Now, this has a significant effect on the fire's development because as the fire burns, the heat and smoke that the fire creates is able to leave through the door while fresh air is also being drawn in towards the fire. Now, this means that the fire has a steady supply of oxygen and it's able to get rid of a lot of the smoke that would otherwise be blocking the incoming oxygen supply. And so this fire's development is in stark contrast to our first example, where in the first example it had already reached a ventilation controlled state by this point in time. Whereas this fire still has a large amount of bright yellow and orange flames and a very steady oxygen supply. Now, the bright yellow and orange flames are a good indicator of a well ventilated flame, meaning they have plenty of oxygen that is allowing them to burn. Now, as you can see, the flames are beginning to run the ceiling meaning that we're getting closer and closer to flashover. And yet the neutral plane is still relatively high and there is still a steady oxygen supply heading into this room. And so this fire is developing in a distinctly different way to our first example, where the fire in our first example's heat release rate was being strongly limited by the available oxygen at this stage. Whereas this fire's development and heat release rate is increasing exponentially as time goes on due to the ongoing supply of oxygen 
that the fire has access to. Now, as you can see, we are moving closer and closer to flashover, and the flames overhead are becoming more widespread throughout the room, with the couch and various other fuel sources extensively pyrolyzing and giving off more and more flammable smoke. Now, what we see in this next stage is that the flames spread across the entire room, creating a large volume of flame. And what happens next is the flames consume a large proportion of the available oxygen in the room. And as you can see here, because of the large amounts of flame in that room, we have used up the available oxygen. And therefore, the fire begins to emit much more smoke as a result. And this is indicating to us that the fire has now entered into a ventilation controlled state. And this has happened not just because of the compartment boundaries and the smoke acting to block oxygen coming into the room, but also because of the fire itself using up a significant proportion of the available oxygen within the room. But if we were to give this fire more air, then more fuels would be burnt, the heat release rate would increase, and the fire would continue to rapidly increase in size. And so ultimately, it all comes down to the fire triangle. Because if you have a lot of heat, and you have a lot of fuel, and you give it a lot of air, then you're going to get a lot of fire. And in fact, for as complicated as these fires really are, they are quite simple when you look at it that way. And so the takeaway message from this one is that if you have to give a fire what it wants, make sure that you are ready to apply water in a timely and effective manner because in the absence of effective water application on the fire, air increases the heat release rate and potential for rapid fire development. All right, so this has ended up as a reasonably long video, but it could have been a lot longer and a lot more technical because there are topics within fuel control and ventilation control that I haven't even mentioned yet. And so this video really should just be seen as an introduction to the subject. It really does just scratch the surface of uh, the things that we can talk about. Now, with that in mind, I do hope that it can serve as a bit of a conversation starter. That's kind of the point of the video, is just to encourage a bit of a conversation around fuel control and ventilation control, and how is it that we're going to be managing that on the fire ground. Because it is an important concept, and it will affect the outcome of the fire, and how safe we're going to be when we're fighting these fires. But that's it for this one. Thanks very much for watching. If you have any comments, chuck them down below. I do appreciate that. And if you liked it, give the video a like. But that one's, that's it for this one. Yeah, I got all the way through it before I stuffed up at the end. So yeah, thanks for watching and I'll catch you in the next one. Bye. <sighs> these, these things aren't easy. I don't want to do it again. I'm not, I'm not doing it again. That's it. Go away now.